Hey there, welcome to the Visual Design Podcast powered by Visual Intelligence. I'm Tyler Lovin, your host and owner of Visual Intelligence, uh, which is all about Tableau and uh, data visualization. Now, this podcast was designed to help uh, Tableau enthusiasts um, on dashboard designs. Now, that has always been the hardest part uh, within Tableau because it's a whole nother side of things that many people don't have experience with. So we're going to be having 30 to 45 minutes episodes uh, talking to different uh, industry experts on dashboard design, uh, tips and tricks, uh, process, tools, uh, all that will be picking their brain to try to get your, your, your creative juices going. Um, now we are going to be doing a YouTube video series, but we'll also be on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you want to listen along. Um, and we do ask uh, if you can subscribe, like, and comment what your favorite tip is, uh, just to try to uh, get this, uh, this series going and, and try to get some traction because it, it, it helps a lot. Um, now, you can explore the channel a little bit. We are all about Tableau, so there is a lot of Tableau tutorials. Um, but today, we're going to be talking to Robert Crocker, which is a great Tableau expert. Um, he has a, a lot of tips and tricks about, uh, about design and a lot of tools that I didn't even know about. All right, and today is going to be our first episode. Um, so I, I hope you like it, and let's get going. Let's run the intro. <music> Hey there, this is Tyler Levin at Visual Intelligence. This is the Visual Design Podcast, uh, Episode 1. Uh, today we have uh, Robert Crocker, a uh, data visualization engineer from Helix. Uh, hey, how you doing, Rob? Good. Doing well. Cool, cool. All right, so uh, tell me about your, your tablet journey and about yourself a little bit. So I, I graduated, it really starts uh, when I graduated. So back in 2011, I graduated from college. So it's been, gosh, like 12 years, going on 12 years. Um, I came across Tableau, I forget what version, in a statistics yep. course. So at well, that point- what was, your, what was your undergrad? My undergrad was supply chain. Okay, so, cool. I, I wanted to figure out like how I could get the most out of technology. Uh, I didn't know anything about data viz. Um, yep. I actually got really into Excel before I got into Tableau, but I'd heard about Tableau before graduating. And my first gig out of college, supply chain optimization. So perfect mm -hmm. kind of role for me. I get to leverage computers to do what they do best and come up with some sort of distribution uh, scenario that reduces transportation costs. Um, and that was mostly in Excel you were using? We, so it was a, a business side role, so not IT. Mm -hmm. um, I did not study computer science or any of that in college. So we used Microsoft Access, which is a, it's, it's referred to as a RAD, a rapid, rapid application I don't know if it was device or environment, but we could build small data pipelines of two gigabytes, no more. And oh. what, what that allowed us to do is take a lot of data that we had from Excel, but clean that data and get it ready for an optimization model. And the company I worked for, Georgia Pacific, they you spend a lot of money on optimization software Mm -hmm. um, with companies like Llamasoft and JDA and all these, you know, uh, enterprise grade tools that nobody hears about unless you work in the space. But I, I got to take this little Excel output that we got and turn it into an actual like distribution network on a map and so, started with the maps, huh? Started, started with like, <laughs> Double yeah, mine started. Mine started with yeah. maps too. I, I like every. It seemed like everyone started off with Tableau. It's like, oh, these are some cool maps. And then, what is Tableau? And then, yeah, that's most people's dream. <laughs> you can double click and like make a map. It's yep. very compelling. 
All right. So, so what, what do you consider your, your high level process when you, you get a client, especially since you've done consulting, you know, you get a client, they're all different, mm-hmm. right? Every project is different. Um, a lot of times, you know, consultants or clients come like, Hey, have you ever done with this data or this data? And I'm like, man, eh, data is all the same, right? You got dimensions, mm-hmm. you got measures, you cut it up. Right. Um, so whenever you get some data and client comes to you, um, kind of how do how do you approach it? What's your, your kind of high level process when you, when you're building a dashboard? So I, I also had the pleasure of creating a course for Udacity called Dashboard Design. Nice. And like while I was building that course, I need to figure out what my, my process was. And mm-hmm. formally, my process tends to be one where uh, we are going to figure out what the objective is, uh, what is the point of this whole initiative, and Cole calls it like, so what if you make a chart like, and you see something? So what action are you going to take? Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing. And that'll take some time to define. Yeah. There may be business questions that we have to suss out. So it's like list your, your uh, business questions that may lead to something that is use, uh, useful to act on, prioritize mm-hmm. those. And then filter it down to something that we we could actually fit onto a screen. Like oh. If your dashboard, yeah, because you was, don't you don't want to be too cluttered for sure. Yeah, yeah. No. And maybe maybe those that list of business questions is in different subjects. Can we group them together? Uh, getting the rank of those and the yeah. sequence of those that tells you like a layout that you can put on your screen mm-hmm. and. For those that are listening, you can read up like the F pattern or the Z pattern or people scanning a screen. And oh. I'll follow like one of those when I go through that like rank list of business questions to answer. So, so just kind of high level, what, what's a Z pattern, F pattern? Yeah, uh, that is if we're thinking about a screen and we talk about the F pattern. Our, when we write an F, we've got that long vertical line on the left-hand mm-hmm. side, and then the uh, the top of the F is going to be a longer horizontal line followed by uh, a horizontal horizontal line in the middle of the screen that's just slightly slightly shorter. And yep. what you want to take from that F would be the scanning path of someone's eyes. They're going to hit that top left generally, maybe do a quick mm-hmm. scan down. And scan over to the right. Maybe they come come back to the middle and like scan from the middle to the middle. But like that bottom right corner, not getting a ton of love. Yeah. Another is the Z pattern, and it's the same uh, sort of approach where you imagine a Z on the screen. So from top left to top right, down to bottom left, bottom right. So someone mm-hmm. doing a quick read across the screen like that. If you can lay out your content in a way that maps to these um, scanning patterns, then it'll it'll almost feel intuitive how they're picking yeah. up information. Yeah, and th- and this is new stuff for people that just do like Excel or just regular analytics, right? They never thought of that before, right? Yeah. So this is a, this is a whole new arena of, of things to pay attention to that probably like when I started off, I didn't even think about that stuff. Right? I was like, oh, what, what's the behavior of my eyes going across the screen, right? You don't think of that stuff when you come from analytics. So um, yeah, that's that's something, you know, probably most people don't even realize now building dashboards is, is a kind of the, the behavior of your eyes and how everything, you know, how you see it and what's more important, which quadrants are more important and all that. So that there's definitely some research people should be doing um, if they haven't done it already. Yeah, because uh, gestalt psychology is a really important like, concept to study for anyone getting into data visualization. Tamar mm-hmm. Munzer has a great book. I forget what it's called, but if you look up Tamar Munzer and data visualization, oh. you'll follow, probably find her book. Uh, but few Tafti, Cole, <clears throat> Cole Nussbaumer, they all talk about this this kind of thing. Nice, nice. So, um, right. yeah. And then what you about like from... layout wise? How do you how do you kind of plan your layout? Do you usually, like, um, like me, I, I usually don't plan layout until I see which charts I have. Um, and then I'd be like, ah, oh, this chart fits better here. Or this chart's better more vertically, horizontally. Um, I kind of like wing my layout. I don't do too much planning up front. Um, what's kind of your, your method of it? Well, I'll, I'll let the like, folks who are listening 
know about the like process from end to end real quick because I was probably going into too much detail. But after we've got business questions and we've prioritized them and ranked them, that'll mm -hmm. sort of tell you in an ideal world, if you could answer all of these business questions in this order, yeah. this is how you would lay them out on some mm -hmm. sort of pattern. And from there, you need to find out, do I actually have the data to answer these questions? So we have what we would like to have these questions answered. Do we have the data for it? Do people even yeah. know what these metrics are? Have they been defined? Maybe they haven't. They're just coming up with stuff that they would like to have. And that may, that may mean that your project is a no-go because yeah. some very key metric doesn't exist yet. And they yeah. just need to go work on that. But at least your process saves you a lot of time. They'll go do the thing, get the metric, come back to you. If you have some data and you're ready to visualize it, Mm -hmm. I I do like used to more than I do now, but I would hand sketch uh, a given business problem, so to speak. So if they want to see, I don't know, the the highest sales for the last quarter, um, and maybe some of the transactions that had a profit margin of I don't know greater than sixty percent. It's like okay, yeah. there's a lot of information there, so. I'll think about the like visual attributes, the visual encodings mm -hmm. that I can leverage to make those insights as um, as insightful as possible, as like lower the cognitive burden as much as possible, given yep. this question and the pre-attentive attributes that we have to work with. So thinking about how the eye works and the encodings that sort of stimulate the eye, the visual system as much as possible, I'll just sort of doodle chart types. And yeah. then once I have the chart types that I think are gonna work for me based on the data that we have and the questions that we need to answer, I will put those in an arrangement on the screen that mm -hmm. lines up with our narrative structure and, and just see how that works. And I'll, I'll do that on paper too. Um, but your, your narrative is, is the ranking, right? Yeah. Kind of the top is the most important and kind of going down. Yeah, how do we how do we give them the context? And I forgot who came up with this one, but overview, zoom, filter, then details on demand is a common pattern. Uh, Google Maps, like you don't get all the details in Google Maps immediately. Is like, yeah. where are we um, now? If you want to zoom into something, um, you could maybe filter down to cafes, and then mm -hmm. it'll give you sort of details about the most popular cafes based on some users ranking in that area that you've zoomed into. So yeah. trying to trying to give you the information that's most actionable. So how can we do that with our layout? Um, and then, yeah, just thankfully with tools like Figma, I can move things around and get a layout. Mm -hmm. And then once I've got a layout in Figma that based on my sketch, um, feels pretty good. I'll pop that into Tableau and actually put data behind it and see okay, what so the what, real data looks like. What is Figma? I, I haven't heard of that one. Figma is a largely user interface design tool. So okay. it's cross, cross platform. Uh, mm -hmm. Sketch was a, another different, oh. like UI design tool, but that was only for Mac. Okay. Now with Figma, we, we can use Figma in browser, uh, on Mac, on PC, and it's actually free um, for the non-team features. So really, cool. really do, great tool. Do you find it's, it's worth doing it in there before Tableau? Is it almost double the work? Um, kind of what's, what's your thought on that? Do you do that now? You know, now you're more developed, you know, advanced, you kind of kind of see it in your head already. Um, kind of what, when did you stop or do you still use that? Still use Figma um, super fast. And I can make background images in Figma that I cannot make okay. in Tableau. So if I wanted to create rounded corners, give something mm -hmm. the look of a shadow, create custom shapes, icons, uh, use my own typography that's not existent in Tableau, I can do that with Figma. Um, oh. And if I'm going from like client to client, because I was a freelancer after Slalom, I can take my themed 
dashboard for client X, duplicate that, and then uh, use that client's brand colors, that client's nice. typography. And Figma allows the styles to almost be variables. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you had three clients, same sales dashboard, but different brand colors, different, uh, different fonts, you can very easily, like in a snap, change, uh, like go from client A, B, and C, three different, differently themed uh, uh, visuals and get that into Tableau. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And then you can use that, especially, you know, like freelancers and stuff, and they're trying yeah. to co compete for projects. You know, if they have like a cool dashboard where they can just quickly change the colors and the, and the, the logo for like a, a applying for a bid or something, yeah. that could be a, a pretty powerful tool too. You can do prototyping in Figma as well. So if you want to walk someone through a wireframe or a mock-up, you can mm -hmm. say, all right, we're going to have this screen and you're going to click this button. And in Figma, you can easily prototype someone clicking this and then that taking them to another screen, which oh. is also um, something that is just so much faster in Figma than Tableau. Nice. The data makes things a little bit more complicated and Tableau's UI is not as flexible as, as what you get with Figma. So. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's how you, you get the layout and, and figure out your kind of structure. Um, yep. What about when you're picking like color designs and formatting stuff? I mean, this is for more like when you're consulting, because when you work for a corporate, you got the same color palette and the same, um, mm -hmm. you know, same text and stuff. But uh, especially with me, a lot of times I, I work with smaller companies and they like, we don't have no color schemes. Like we don't, you know, so it's like I come up with it or their color scheme is just ugly and I want to redo it anyway because I don't want to put, you know, those ugly colors on the dashboard. So they're like, all right, just do what you want. Um, so how, how do you how do you manage that? Uh, yeah, I can walk through, if you think it's the right time, we can start uh, yeah, let's see walking it. through a quick layout and I'll show you how that, that works. The Figma workspace. Um, okay. or this is, these are my Figma files. If I want to create a new design file, I'll just pop this open, untitled design file in my main project. So uh, let's just call this. Or can, can we see one of the ones that are already done? Sure. So um, we... Let's go to... Yeah, because I'm actually curious because I, I, I never really thought about doing this just because of the, the time, you know, it's just like, you know, you already got a whole bunch of time spending on the, the dashboard. So I usually just get straight into it. <laughs> uh, this is, um, so this is Fig Jam. All right. So let me go to, that is a very short one. Polish, tug, trying to find something that is not, uh, let's see. I'm also trying to find something that is not client as well. I understand. Let's do, so this was a makeover Monday. Um, cool. All right. So this makeover Monday, uh, was it a makeover Monday? I think I'll go to my public so you can see the actual dashboard. Yeah. Uh, search for myself. Yep. Authors. And here we go. So probably looks familiar uh, based on what you saw. And so. this little guy, click on a thing, and you see some some text pop up. All mm -hmm. right. So I put that. I I created a frame or a workspace. This is similar to a dashboard, and you see some pink lines here. Those do not ship with the image. They're just to okay. help me lay things out, right? So okay. I've got an image here and it'll snap to these little lines. In the dashboard course that I made with Udacity, we talk about why a 12 column grid. 12 is divisible by two, six, three, four. So mm -hmm. it's divisible by like many things like uh, when you factor it out. And that means that at different screen sizes, we can respond to that with a multitude of layouts. Or if we're in a single um, 
single screen size, we could do, in this case, we've got a one column grid, right? We've got one element taking up all of the columns here. But yep. if we had three elements or four elements, so we went going across the top, we could equally lay those out. If you've got five and sort of breaks the 12 column thing. But uh, it's that's a good tip. Aside. Yeah, 12 column grid, leverage it. Um, and Figma allows you to you know, make these 12 column grids, 10 column grid, six column grid, whatever you want. Uh, it's right there for you. So nice. I, I take that and just, this is not the Figma way of doing things, but I created a rectangle here and it's very easy to give it some uh, corner radius, right? Mm -hmm. So I was going for a, a joyful sort of layout for some reason, even though it's abortion. I think I was trying to make the whole abortion thing less uh, yeah. ah, because that's yeah. not, not, not an amazing topic. So I don't know. Let me get you to engage with this in a way that's not as off-putting. Um, yeah. We've got some rounded corners. We've got Roboto. So this might ship with Tableau. But we've got some little circles here. Um, the, the circles in Figma, I can click my eye and go select another color. I can just grab it. And I found this color picker is actually much more accurate than the color picker in Tableau. So oh. that's useful. Um, if I and then to like, to I saw that color palette you had there. How, how did you get that color palette? Let's look. This is probably from that cool extension that I was talking about. Let me see if these are text elements. Okay, perfect. So this is a group. So I was I was helping myself out so that I could double click on this, copy mm -hmm. paste it into Tableau. But in Figma, what you do is uh, we can create a a frame, and we'll give this frame a, a color. And if I want to make this an auto layout, which is just a dynamic layout, and bump this, maybe make some space in between uh, one of these elements and another. I will duplicate that. Hold on. Let me control Z, control Z. I'm going to put a group. So make a group and then auto layout. And then let's see if I can duplicate. Yep. So now what I can do. Click on frame, grab my color, click on a frame, grab my color, click on a frame, okay. grab my color. And um, I just put I just put text inside and of the right. But where do you where you get like your color inspiration? So and how did you decide this this color inspiration here? Let's let's type in autumn. Autumn. Maybe that's why you spell autumn. Take it ends um, up in maybe. Oh, let's do that. Uh, like that. Yeah. Maybe like optimal. <laughs> right, um, that's why I'm in math. I'm, I'm not going to spell any. Huh. All right. Well, what we could also do. There's no the M. First... I think it's A U T U M N. Perfect. No, no, no M. A U T autumn. Right. Yeah. And then an M. And then an M N at the end. Yeah. I think that, right. that looks kind of right. Let's Maybe. See, does this give us. Nah, yeah. that don't look right either. It does. Maybe. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, does, it definitely does not look right, but whatever. Yeah, it does right. look right. So we've got we've got beautiful stuff, right? Dribble is where I go for a lot of inspiration. Okay. I can and go here. Um, doesn't look like they're giving me any uh, palettes, but mm -hmm. if I just I use Snagit a lot, so okay. yeah, I got that too. Yeah, Snagit. Grab a little screenshot and. Uh, I'm just going to copy this and throw it into Figma, right? Oh. And paste it. Now, we could do a whole thing about setting up a design system, but uh, don't have time. But for that. From there, yeah, from there, you just cut and grab the, the color picker and just start picking totally. away. Okay. I'm like, all right. Yeah. And, nice. you know, I'm leveraging some other designers' uh, intuitive talent for, yeah. for color. Yeah, no, that's smart. No, no reason to, to recreate the wheel. They, they did all the research already for you. Okay, if you cool. So make the palette in Tableau, you could go to um, this inspect pane. And mm -hmm. if we wanted to get the hex codes, we could, you know, put this on our clipboard, 
and oh. pop it into a preferences file and you'd have it to work with in Tableau. Nice. So, so I guess we kind of answered that next question. So Figma, uh, Dribble was the other one that's called. Any other resources you use? Yeah. And people uh, don't think very highly of this, but I like coolers. Um, Coolers.co. Okay. What you can do here is hop into the generator. And again, let's say that we've got Autumn as a theme that Mm -hmm. We now think we know how to spell. Um, I'm going to say this is an autumn, autumn color to me. Okay. Um, so this would be like their, their main logo color or something. Sure. Yeah, let's, let's call this their primary color. I'm okay. going to click on the, the current hex. I'm going to paste this in, enter, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to lock it. So I'll just lock that and hit the space bar. So it sort of randomly generates other colors that in some way uh, work with this one. They seem to be maybe not analogous, but but they they get along. If okay. you want to edit so, the- So I got palette, some, some color theory in this selection probably, right? Yeah, but you can, you can adjust it to oh. be analogous, be complementary. Uh, and nice. let's, let's try, Analogous if we upgraded. These did not <laughs> used to be paid. Uh, uh, but I they always try to get you. Yeah. No, it's it is a great tool. It looks like they've monetized it since then. But okay. you know, if I like this one and I wanna choose that, lock it. Oh, that's smart. And we begin um, sort of narrowing things down. Okay. Yes. So yeah, so the use of a, a color scheme generator for sure. That's all right, so do you have any uh, do's and don'ts? Oh, you want to show another one? Uh, Y'all got to know about uh, Color Brewer. So okay, yeah, I haven't heard about this one, so let's, let's hear that one. Cynthia Brewer, um, she has come up with color, like a color system mainly uh, for, well, you've got sequential, diverging, and uh, qualitative. So it's, it's, can be hard to make colors on a scale that are mm -hmm. differentiated enough to yeah. work through visualization. Um, yep. So this is this is very useful. Um, we perceive color in a nonlinear manner, and, and Cynthia Brew has made this nice tool for people okay. to use. Um, we've got a whole folder here. Uh, I don't know if Leonardo is going to work from data to vivids. Let's see. Let's see. I don't think Leonardo. Yeah, unfortunately, their website's somewhat down. But those are uh, those are my main uh, go-to. But largely just dribble. I'll find some things that I like mm -hmm. and go from there. Adobe is maybe the most commonly referenced that I hear about. Adobe cool. has an extensive tool to use online. Um, of course, they've changed up quite a bit since I've last used it, but you can um, do a whole lot with this and go with your um, different methods uh, yep. for coloring and find something. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's one thing that I learned when I started off, which like I said, you, you don't really know to learn, um, but learning about the color theory is, is pretty important when you're doing data visualization. Mm -hmm. um, so that all these terms over here, the monochromatic, all that, that's all based off of the color theory, which, you know, it's mostly for artists, um, but you're, you're an artist when it comes to Tableau. So uh, definitely, you know, read up or look at some YouTube videos about the color theory, because it, it definitely has a lot to do with what you're doing. And that's what all of this stuff is here that we're seeing. And I, I'll be honest, I do not understand color theory very well, but I will gladly, it, uh, I will gladly leverage these tools. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a, like, I'll, I'll do this, kind of like what you're doing, and then just click the, the different color theory, you know, modes, essentially, and then whatever one visually looks good to me, that's the one I pick. <laughs> so, no, so I, I completely get it. One, one other thing, like, when you do get to using Figma, is mm -hmm. you'll find out about find out about plugins and 
Tints and Shades is a plugin that allows you to um, generate, uh, wants me to click a, an object. So instead of a frame, and what this is going to allow me to do is go from my primary color to basically what we saw in uh, coolers, right? So I can have a very quick um, like series of tints and variants on this this single scale to pull from um, with that nice that's, plugin, that's... tints and shades. Yeah. A lot of tools. And, 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 and do you see this as a more of a, a science or an art when it comes to picking these colors? Well, uh, I know it's a science, but because I don't understand all the, <laughs> the details of the science, uh, and I'm not an artist, I'll just say I try, to, yeah. uh, I try to do my best. I will ask for feedback um, and and, and go from there. So I'm like an amateur scientist when it comes to building dashboards that work. Uh, I don't know that I make dashboards that have that emotional feel. I would consider this to be like an artist's application of color theory to something. Would I ever come up with something like this? Absolutely not. Is that my intention? Yeah. No. But I hope to I hope to create something insightful. So my visualizations are often very, very simple. Um, because, I mean, I could say I don't know what I'm doing, but um, I think that I'll make fewer mistakes um, by, by keeping it simple. So, like, it's very clear what I want you to be looking at here um, because it's so, like, alarmingly red. <laughs> yeah. um, and I use very few colors. So this was a redesign of an app that I've got on my phone and not a whole lot of colors. Mm -hmm. um, and that's intentional because I, I guess I don't know how to use colors well. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Sorry. All right, so what, what do you feel are kind of like, if you just pick one or two best practices when it comes to designing, uh, what, what do you think maybe the one or two like most important things to, because I mean, talked about the, you know, the color scheme and all that. And then like I said, it just, it, if you know, just a little bit, you know, that's good. Like I'm not an expert either. You know, it, I know enough to know that it's, it exists. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but like, what would be, you know, a couple of things that are just best practices. Like you'd say, you know, everything else you can do or don't, but these two things you got to do. So give yourself a typographic hierarchy. Um, another, so I'll be like, what, what is typographic hierarchy? If I say type scale, um, why is it in caps? Type scale. All right, and now I'm going to go to type scale, type scales. You, you want to use a typographic hierarchy to oh just like we did with colors, um, mm -hmm. you want to differentiate like that, that marquee text or the, the headline from the chart title text, from the uh, subtitle text to the control text, to your axis text and um, annotation. So the, getting a solid type scale yeah. that is sort of giving you something consistent to target when creating or adding text to your dashboards. Uh, it's, it's something that very few people do, mm -hmm. um, but that consistency really, really cleans up your, your dashboards. Okay. So, and, but the I, tablet does this kind of automatically for you, right? Or do you find like that doesn't do it good? Or what's, what's kind of your I thought mean, on, on? If you wanted, if you want to like this, uh, you know, Tableau didn't pick what what text I would pick yeah. here as my like chart. Title. But like the but, kind of the standard, more analytic dashboard, you got the you know the, the title pay or the, the show title, which is I don't know maybe twenty something, and then the the mm -hmm. the worksheet titles are like fifteen, 
And then I don't mm. know, text maybe like 10 or something. Like when it, when you're doing kind of standard dashboards, not more of the kind of, you know, Tableau Monday things. Um, it's kind mm. of done originally. Do you do you still change that even then? Or do you kind I'm of leave always, it, leave how it is? Yeah. You always mess I, with it. I'm always messing with it. But like if if you do change it, just make sure that the ways in which you're using that title no. um, is consistently sized wherever you're using it. So if okay. I was going to annotate a chart and I'm using a certain text and size here, I want to make sure that I annotate with the same size um, in the other place. Access text, okay. make sure that's consistent. So stuff like so that. Stuff in painting. What about like the, the font weight? I, I see that done mm -hmm. a lot now where, yep. like, you know, especially when Tableau came out with their, their new weights that, you know, the medium, the light, the bold, um, it, it looks pretty cool. Like I didn't utilize it a lot in the beginning, but it looks pretty cool when you change the font weights up, um, especially, you know, if you have like, let's uh, like a title and then like a subtitle under it and having like a heavy weight and a lightweight, like, I don't know the science behind it, but I know certain mix and matches look pretty good. Do you, do you pay attention to that? Yeah. So there's... The, uh, there's a rule that I heard, and I forget where I heard it from, but when you're changing uh, fonts, so let's mm -hmm. say we go from title to subtitle, change as few things as possible. So okay. the, the size is likely going to be different. So you've changed yeah. that. Don't go from, like if you can help it, don't go from a black all caps to you know, sentence cased, thin, italic, different font style for your sub yeah. subtitle. Like when you when you think about those extremes, it sounds ridiculous, but yeah. it's a it's a slippery slope. So when designing, uh, there was this analogy that I heard from a course called Learn U Learn UI Design, and mm -hmm. it said think about design as riding a unicycle. When you're experimenting with something, fall forward and backward rather than just you know always getting on the bike and falling forward falling forward falling forward the only way that you're going to find your balance is to you know do a font that's too large do a font that's yeah. too heavy and then do something that's too thin do something that's too small like mm -hmm. find find that intuition for yourself by um experimenting uh, on the extremes so yeah the the weights the weights do matter and, and they can totally affect your design. Just okay. got to make sure it's legible. But yeah, yeah. Type, type was a big one. Um, white space would be the next important thing that people really do. And then, yeah, and yeah. I, I think people people don't do that enough. Um, oh, like the, the padding and the white spaces, I think they, they cram it a lot. Um, so kind of what's your, what's your best practice when it comes to, to having some white space? Because I mean, really, you know, when you have the dashboard, you have just a limited amount of space. So it's like, man, I got all these visits and I'm trying to put in this little amount of space. And you don't want that scroll. So a lot of times, you know, you try to throw in and try to squish as much as you can. Um, but, you know, a lot of times that's not the best thing to do. So kind of what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I will try to do like units of eight so there's this spacing concept if we were to take and you can you can make this consistent as well so mm -hmm. consistency is a key in all of these things if i create a square here and i make it eight pixels well i can duplicate this a couple times um and then bump this up to 16. And then we go like 32. And then we go maybe 48. Now, these spacing units become mm -hmm. what I use to um, separate text from one another, but also like rectangles from one another. Um, yeah. So I would say like whatever you're doing, just make it make it consistent. Because as soon yeah. as something is uh, not consistent, it's gonna grab your attention. And if, uh, if you did not want to grab someone's attention, but you did simply because something was inconsistent, then mm -hmm. I think that's a failure on your design, right? Yeah. So if these two things go away, um, you, you aren't thinking about the space in between them because it's consistent, it's not, it's not in question. But if I move it 
just like that. Now, these rectangles are closer yeah. to one another than these. So these are actually more related to one another than these are to one another. Mm -hmm. So now I've created a relationship sort of inadvertently because um, my spacing wasn't consistent. Spacing. Yeah, no, it, it's, and I, I'm not gonna lie, I have a bad habit of eyeballing things. <laughs> uh, I guess it maybe it's just because like, I'm always like, just trying to get like, I'm pumping out dash right at the dashboard. So, you know, I don't have that much time to like actually calculate everything. So oh, I'm like, can. well, if, if my eyeballs can, can't catch it, then I'm, I'm assuming somebody else's eyeball can catch it. <laughs> I, I definitely have a bad habit of doing that. But like you said, like I did, like when you did that, like it, it definitely looked like, like, all right, I'm trying to relate those two compared to you know a little spacing on the outside for you know horizontally and you you know you don't even think about how someone could portray that you know of being like oh are these supposed to be grouped together because a little bit they're not even consciously thinking that just looking at the spacing is subconsciously like oh these are supposed to be together and a lot of the data visualization stuff that that we have to pay attention to is how are people subconsciously looking at this because they don't know you know oh they put this a little closer so you know we're supposed to group this it's just something they're doing naturally so being mm -hmm. you know the developer we got to kind of know how the psychology works with all this which like i said is, is something completely new to most people that are just getting into tableau because it's, it's a whole new beast when it comes to that yeah so i i hate the calculations as well but mm -hmm. in figma i can hold option and from the thing that I select, it'll tell me the distance from the things around it. So now that I got my cursor here, I can see, all right, this is 16. And then yeah. this is 16. Um, there is, so cool. like, so when, once you build this in here, yeah. right? How, how, just kind of quickly, how do you get this from Tableau or from here to Tableau? Do you just put this like as a background and then just start moving stuff where it's supposed to go and then delete in it or you leave it in the background? like? What's that and translation? So, so you can see uh, this. You can actually see how everything's laid out. Um, I don't know how to switch to outline mode, but I will. Yeah, just, just kind of high level. You don't have to do it. Just high level talk through it. Do you, do you just put it, you make it an image and then import and then, you know, float a chart on top of it? Like kind of what's, what's that? I will totally float a chart on top of it. So let's say I want to something with rounded corners and I want to give it a nice, nice drop shadow, um, a, a good enough drop shadow. And then this becomes my background image. Um, mm -hmm. So I will, I'll say, all right, I'm going to put- So you even, do, you even do your text in here? You don't even write your text in Tableau most of the time? If the text is not data driven, so not data driven, yeah, yeah, then I okay. do I, I do my text right in here because again I get all the benefits of Figma to space these things out mm -hmm. um, very quickly and consistently, like much more consistently than I can do in Tableau. Um, well. So you do but, you do your background and your your titles and your text and all that and then you just kind of float you import this in Tableau as in the dashboard image and then just kind of float your your charts where they need to go. Yeah, so I want to export this frame. I'll click on the frame. I will export. Always got to export at two x because otherwise the text will get pixelated. So okay. I export it as two x. Um, right now it export an image that's called desk, desktop one. But if I said like some image. Um, then it would export with this image and then bring that in Tableau, make sure that there's no padding in Tableau. Um, mm -hmm. We open up Tableau. You can see like this is a background image. So right now you don't see the image. Yeah. But um, now you see the image. Right? Okay. So this image is, it has no padding and it's fit and centered. So that's how I go from like got these it, guys in a place to um, you know, a dashboard that looks like everything's been positioned appropriately. And if I, the way I figure out those positions is I'll just basically put a rectangle where I want to chart and mm -hmm. click on that element. And then I say, okay, my chart is going to be at 90 to 12, 12 with a width of this and a height of height of this okay so those are my coordinates 
that I'll then go in here, click the thing, and just pop them in because they line up with them yeah. perfectly. But, All right, cool. Cool. No, that's, that's pretty cool. I, 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 I've never done a dashboard like this, to be honest with you. It's, it usually, like, I'll, I'll do all the kind of highlighting stuff in the, in the, the, the tableau itself. Um, I, have, I haven't even thought about doing this, but it seems like it has a lot more flexibility to it, which is why probably you do it than, than using the tableau. Yeah. I mean, dude, if you've got five text elements in tableau, those are mm -hmm. five elements that you need to tweak. Um, Whereas here in Figma, if I want to change, if somebody doesn't like the font I'm using, yeah. I can literally just grab these and like change the font on the fly and like everything, everything updates, no problem. Okay. Export a new image, they're good to go. Uh, it really separates concerns. Yeah. Nice, nice. No, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. That's a great tip. Um, any oh. other? Uh, kind of design tips or tricks you want to throw out there? No, we talked about color briefly, yeah. Um, yeah. maybe in a, in a rough sort of way. There's a lot to learn about layout, um, but I think layout, like font hierarchy, consistency with spacing, and use more white space than you think you might need yeah. to. Um, and And that's... Really, it. That's a, so that's so that's many a lot. dashboards. <laughs> I don't know. So many dashboards are inconsistent. Don't have good white space. The layouts are shoddy, and the the text is all over the place. We could talk about icons, but I won't bother. Um, yeah. There, if anybody wants to go learn uh, in like thirty minutes, uh, they can go to my site, and on there is a free. Figma basics course that literally takes you 30 minutes nice. and they'll learn like a lot. That's, I might take that myself. <laughs> All right, cool. All right. Uh, last question. Is there, what, what do you feel is the one thing that most people don't do as far as design goes? Uh, so, I mean, you might already said it with the white spacing, um, but is there anything else you could think of that, that, just they, they, people don't pay attention to that they should be paying attention to? Layout, layout and spacing. Like, I mean, they're kind of coupled together. They are different, yeah. but I think white space is a tool. <laughs> mm -hmm. It is, it is space. Um, and, and proximity to things matters. So I feel like it's this invisible power that like when, when leveraged really well is super, super powerful and just makes such an impact. So it's the difference between like going into a luxury car dealership and like a junkyard, if you will, like to be on extreme ends, like yeah. our, our junkyards, like well-organized and everything's spaced out there or bins and whatnot. Absolutely not. But uh, a luxury car uh, dealership, like you're probably going to have, this car with a lot of space around it because you want to focus mm -hmm. on this vehicle. Junkyard, whatever, like have at it. Even a used car lot, yeah. even a, a standard car lot, like everything's packed together because eh, like this one's just as important as that one. You know, it's a lot of cognitive, it's a cognitive burden for you to, you know, sift through it. It's somewhat anxiety inducing. But when you go into um, a dashboard that's well designed and the space has been thought about, it just, feels so much better. So if anything, I'd love people to be more conscious as they're thinking about like spacing, using space intelligently cool. on their dashboards. Yeah. All right, cool, cool, man. Well, I appreciate it. You, you, I, I learned a lot. <laughs> uh, so no, that's, this is very helpful. Uh, I really appreciate you, you jumping on and, and, and I'm sure uh, the, the viewers are gonna be able to get a lot of good input on this. Um, uh, all right, cool, man. Well, I, I appreciate the talk. All right, no problem. 
all right so that that was some good tips uh, a lot of that stuff i didn't even know obviously if y'all saw me asking a lot of questions uh, because i was learning too great thing about this podcast is i might have learned a lot of this as well um so yeah i mean he gave us some good stuff with uh, the figma um with how he he picks his colors i mean a, a lot of people don't know that there's it's such a psychological uh, uh way of viewing things when it comes to daily visualization um so you know being able to know what you don't know you know uh, is, is a big thing so uh, uh, yeah, research all that stuff he's talking about. Um, it, it's definitely a, a good a good topic to know because Tableau is much more than just creating charts. All right, you guys. Um, so uh, thanks for, for coming. Uh, please subscribe and like and comment um, because we're going to be continually adding uh, uh, more developers on here for you. Um, and put that notification bell so you know next time uh, we get a new developer on to, to give you some good tips. All right, you guys. Thanks for joining the, the Visual Design Podcast. See you on the next one. Oh, 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 oh,